today we have a guest that has really made an impact on the the industry and i'm totally honored to have him here on the show and share his knowledge with you guys out there and uh most of you will probably know him definitely he's a uk based is jeremy king and uh we're going to be talking a bit about his journey and his learnings on that journey and actually also what he's he, up to right now and how he actually sees the, the future of hospitality. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. It's a great, great pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, uh, the future of hospitality, quite a big subject. Yeah, it's a very big, and maybe we're not going to be able to unpack all of it, but for people out there that maybe, you know, have met you or maybe not sure about hundred percent, what was actually Jeremy's journey? you know, into hospitality and how does it evolve? Can you give like a, the quick version of uh, your journey in hospitality and, and, and to, to where we are today? And certainly, I, I think I'm typical of a lot of people in hospitality in that I wasn't vocational. I, over the years when <clears throat> I've talked to staff, I've discovered that it's actually chefs who tend to be vocational rather than front of house people like myself. And I fell into a very, very simple reason as I came up into London at the end of 72 to start merchant banking on January the 1st, 73. And I was staying with a school friend who worked in a wine bar and a wine bar was a very new invention of those days. You couldn't open a bar in London. Uh, you couldn't get a license. The, the pubs uh, had a cartel. And so, you, but you could open a wine bar. And I worked two nights a week and like so many people to supplement income, whether it's a student or a worker, et cetera. And the, and the great beauty is that as a comparatively shy, uh, introspective person, they also get an element of social life, uh, working in, a, in somewhere like a wine bar and that comes free and you're, so you're not spending and you're earning money. And so it became a background to my life. It's not the very first thing I'd, I'd done in hospitality. I was always very intrigued from doing anything from selling ice cream in the uh, seaside town that I lived through to as a 14 year old stocking bars in the, in the holiday camp. And I took an immen immense amount of enjoyment for some reason. I think there's an element of physicality. Anyway, merchant banking didn't work out. I'd gone into that instead of going to university, which probably wasn't a mistake of that particular university, but I realized I had made a mistake and chose to go up to, to university, to Cambridge, in fact, as a mature student. And the fateful thing in my life is that I, I had read a book called The Dice Man, uh, a cult book in 71 about a man who determined his life by the throw of the dice. And I used to do it just for, for fun. I mean, I, sometimes I do it on a gambling basis, but I would, because I was bored at the bank, I would determine my life, for instance, whether I even went to work or, or not. And if I did go to work, the sort of, I might take on another character, or I might pretend to lose my voice, or I might not just go to work at all. And the dice started to get a grip on me. <laughs> and, uh, there's some fairly strange stories along the way, but more particular to, to my career is that I, in the interim, whilst I was waiting to go up to university, I worked full time in the wine bar, quite liked it. And then when the matriculation papers came through in May, uh, what was that? 75, I threw the dice and there was one as to whether what I would do about my university career. And most of the opportunities of the double dice throw was to go up to the university, maybe change the course, maybe change the timing, things like that. But there was one throw, which I think was a double six, which said, if you, if you get the managership of this bar or similar within a month of your 21st birthday, you stay in hospitality for life. And I did, and there's many a time I regretted it. And so I stayed 
in hospitality. I tried to get out of hospitality. I went for career guidance. And all they could pick up on the fact was that I was logical and arithmetic and so on. And they said I should be an accountant. And I said, no, I, I could be a turf accountant, which is a <laughs> British uh, thing for a bookmaker. And they said, that's brilliant. You'd be, you'd be out in there. And it was thanks to a very, um, a very brilliant man. Again, as so often ha happens in hospitality, he'd been through Harvard, a guy called John Maxwell had been through Harvard. He was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, and there he was running front of house at Joe Allen. And I got to know him, and Joe Allen was a new hot restaurant. There were two restaurants in London at the time. One was Lang's Brasserie, which I used to go to, and the other was uh, Joe Allen. And I said, I'm leaving the business. And he said, no, you're not. And and I said, well, it's just, I'm just not, I'm not enjoying it enough. He said, what do you like about it, the business? Come on, tell me what you like. I said, I like restaurants. And what sort of restaurants? Big restaurants, I said. And he said, right, you're coming to work at Joe Allen. I said, no, I'm not. It's so wrong. I'm sort of slightly uptight Englishman working in a New York speakeasy type place. He said, no, well, you're coming because we're going to show you how to run a big restaurant. And I think you'll excel at that. And more importantly, and I think you'll get more out of it, we'll show you how not to run a big restaurant. And you'll learn from what we do badly. During that time, going to Langens, I got to know Chris Corbin, and we were running in parallel. And it was actually, in a funny way, what brought us most together was the eponymous Peter Langen, who started Langens Brasserie and Odin's and so on, who was atrociously behaved but brilliant Irishman who died at the age of 47, self-immolating. In fact, he came to me and he said, in his Irish drawl, I, I gather you should be the person opening my new restaurant. And I said, well, I don't think so. I'm 25 years old. I, I, I don't think I'm qualified for that. And Langan's was a really hot restaurant on a world scale. And I spent a lot of time with him, lot, learned a lot, but I also spent a lot of time with Chris. And eventually when the Langan initiative fizzled out, Chris and I resolved that we would open a restaurant. And in turn, he'd been approached by Joseph Hategi, who was a, a leading fashion man. And he said, I want to open a restaurant. Will you do it? And he said, yes, if I do it with Jeremy King. And out of that, we had found a site which was, had previously been called Caprice and at the time was called the Arlington. And we did it together. It wasn't a great success. And when I say that, the relationship more than anything, we, we didn't see eye to eye. We separated after a few months. And then I managed to raise money. My parents very generously mortgaged their house to allow Chris and I to take, uh, take control of the priest. And it was the best thing that ever happened. And adversity can be such a, mm. can, can, strengthen you and teach and, and so on, if you're prepared to hear. And one of the great things about this is that we had what is nowadays almost unique situation where we owned hundred percent of the, of the restaurant. And therefore we were able to decide how we did the restaurants without anybody telling us what to do. So that's the, that's how it got going really. It's interesting that, you know, people say we fell into hospitality, but uh, you decided that with the dice and I actually didn't know that. And that's quite interesting, but also it's interesting for, as for many, and this was also for myself, was that you had this mentor, this person that came and helped you on the journey, you could see something in you and actually directed you a bit. This mm. is this way, Jeremy, and this is, this is going to work out because I think that's often in hospitality, you get huge responsibility in early age or lots of people, lots of revenue, lots of costs that suddenly yeah. is dumped on you, which you, you never learned to do before you stand in the situation. And that having that mentor is quite critical. I think. I, I think it's critical. And I think to be frank, the problems that Chris and I went through and in the early days of Caprice, when we took control of it, I, I remember standing in the restaurant just before 10 o'clock 
of an evening in March 82 and not being a single person in the whole restaurant. And uh, it, it, yes, the early people had gone and it wasn't that busy, so they'd gone uh, quicker. And then the post theater, because luckily I had a lot of theatrical friends who really made a big difference to the restaurant because they, they were recognizable and they were staying late and they were uh, vivacious and uh, atmospheric in, in the restaurant. But I think what it did for Chris and I is that it took away the hubris and too often it's too easy to open a, a restaurant and do very well and suddenly it looks easy and you open two or three or four. For us, we were much more humble. And having said that, when we eventually opened the Ivy, which had been yet, a, yet again another old restaurant which had fallen into disrepute, mm. I... I can remember us deciding, uh, uh, people were thinking, oh, we'd be busy from the beginning. And in fact, the first night we opened, the IRA bombed the Junior Carton Club. And, uh, and that was on our sort of guests night. And the following night, I think we did our full opening, 46 covers. And it was, it was an uphill struggle. Nobody really remembers that. And it's just with the Caprice when we took it back. Fellow restaurateurs in, in London, I discovered later took out a uh, sweepstake uh, betting on how long we'd last before we'd fold again. And but that and the, the, the adversity actually spurs spurs me on. And I can remember opening Saturday lunch at the Ivy, and we did a zero. And anybody who's in the restaurant business who's ever done a zero, that is uh, that is an extraordinary experience. You, in the theatre, you don't ever do a zero because you, if nobody turns up, you just shut the theatre and go away. But in a restaurant, you have to stand there. You, yeah. you have to keep the staff positive. You have to reassure them. And you have to, you almost got this fixed smile on your face, hoping that somebody will walk through the door. And they don't. It's humbling. It's good. It's very, very good. And what I've noticed with restaurants is that Hey, even my own is that it will get incredibly popular and successful. And often it's the staff and sometimes the proprietors start to get very complacent and they start to think they can do no wrong. When you hear phrases like staff say, I don't know, <clears throat> I don't know why they're complaining about their table. I did them a favor by getting the one, the one in the first place. And they say, oh, no, 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 you, you didn't do anybody a favor. They did a favor coming to this restaurant and it's it's a it's a it's a very interesting interesting process that we and one of the one of the things i would do is from time to time is when i talk with staff and said those who've done an opening i want you to, to think back to when you did an opening and how it was those first few weeks how everybody who walked through the door was a, was a, a hero was, was a, you know was lauded and and treated so well. Where is that same sense of hospitality a year later when you're absolutely absolutely packed? Because every person who walks through the door might be the best customer you ever have. Every person you talk away on the phone. I mean, I've I've had it myself where a telephonist in a popular restaurant will laugh at you if, uh, if, <clears throat> for having the audacity to ask for a table, table that evening. We can be very bad in the restaurant business and humility is, is important. And I, I'd like to think that both Chris and I had that. And if we, if we, there was a couple of questions I was thinking about as we do, we'll take them one at a time. I was thinking about you and Chris, what kind of partnership was that? Because you went on working together for a long time, developing the, the venture. How would you describe that uh, as, as two founding partners? Where, where did you cover each other's flanks? But it, was a, it was an interesting process because Chris had trained, uh, he'd actually trained as a chef and he trained in the at, at hotel catering school. And he knew how it how it should be done. And one of, 
Well, I think one of our great strengths is that as an autodidact myself, completely self-taught or through observation, he would set out how traditionally a restaurant would be sorted out. It might be stations, the brigades system, the head waiters, commie waiters, so on and so forth, captains. And then I would tend to look at it and my rational, logical brain would come and say, that's, why do we do it that way? And they would say, oh, well, that's, people say, well, that's how it's always been done. One of the great, the, one of the great joys for me is looking at how it could be done better. And I, you know, the, the, there's two strands of this and because the hospitality is, is naturally incredibly reactionary, hates change. And the thing my staff will hear me talk about more and more, my, my story will always be of the quote from Prince Tancredi in the, in the novel, The Leopard, well, it's a se semi-novel about the changes in Italy in 19th century and through a, an interesting book in itself. And the, one of the characters goes to the quite radical Prince Tancredi, who's uh, I think the nephew of the, of, of the hero of the, uh, of the book. And he says, why do we have to have all this change? Why can't it stay the same? And Prince Tancredi says, for things to remain the same, everything has to change. And I'm a great advocate of that. And, um, uh, because you don't change the ethics or the ethos or the principles or the integrity or anything like that, but you look always and it's, it's some of the older staff would always laugh because we might be in a meeting following winning a, an award, you know, let's say at the, the Woolsey or something. So we won an award and I'll ask the, the assembled manager, just how are we going to win that next year? And inevitably, while some of the old hands keep quiet, cause they know what's coming, somebody falls into the trap of saying by maintaining our standards, and I say, all right, thank you. That maintaining standards is the route to bankruptcy. And they say, well, how can that be? If, you know, use with these standards, we've just won an award. So if we maintain them, surely we have a chance of winning again. I said, yeah, but if your aspiration is to maintain standards, actually they go down. It's, it's, it's imperceptible at first, but they slowly go down because there's, there's uh, an element of arrogance and complacency comes in and meanwhile other people are getting better and so you actually the, the split and you can't suddenly realize that actually you fought you've fallen behind and for me in a successful restaurant i mean particularly in the days when the phone was was always the way is that my fear was when the phone stopped ringing because what happens in a restaurant you can, if you have a busy restaurant, you can completely mess up your service that evening. You'll still be full tomorrow and tomorrow you can completely do a terrible service and you'll still be full next week. And even next week you can carry on. And I don't know. And I never wanted to find out how long you'd got, but suddenly the phone's not ringing and there's nothing you can do because in, in my style of restaurants, you can't do a promotion. You can't do a discount that just makes it worse. So for it's com complacency and arrogance are the enemies of restaurateurs. And it's exactly and the great thing is, you know, I talk about restaurateurs and quite often people say to me, what is the difference between a restaurateur and a restaurant owner? And I said, it's very simple. The restaurateur does it from the floor and the restaurant owner does it from the boardroom and it does show. And when you're looking when restaurateuring is transferred into figures, it's very easy to make decisions about margins and so on and so forth, because you're not, or staffing or anything, because you're not looking into the eye of either the customer or the member of staff. Uh, but if you're a restaurateur, you do it from the floor and you feel it and you know it, uh, it's not the way necessarily to make the most money, but I think it's a more enjoyable way of living. You also talked, Jeremy, about humility, but just jump back and take that because 
I was reading a totally different thing, preparing for another interview, where there's a guy called Edward Hess. He's a professor. He's written a lot of book, and he talks about the the challenge of technology coming and actually that we really need to, you know, discover ourselves and come back to ourselves and actually learn some very basic things. Like one of the things is humility, because he thinks that's lacking in the world and one of the issues in the world. And you talk about humility in, in, in hospitality uh, and you trust a little bit on it. Why yeah, is right. that so important in this, you know, always important, but why is it more important than ever you think from, from your, from your journey? It, I think the humility, the humility leads to other human conditions. I mean, I, I think it all becomes about humanity and you, you were talking about technology and of course, at the moment, there's the, well, <clears throat> so much talk about AI and how it's going to affect us. And it's some 18 months ago, so whether it was prescient of me or, or not, but I not long uh, before I lost the auction for the restaurants, I was going around all my front of house teams, particularly the reception team. And theoretically, as, as the, my personnel department said, it was a, a masterclass in hospitality, looking after people and the ways of doing it. And I was doing things, and I, I never do a set lecture or anything. I, I, I react to the situation. And then I was with one particular group, and something got into my head and I, I went in a different direction where I said, okay, I brought you together to inform you that I decided to replace you all with artificial intelligence, with robots. And they're looking at me and they think, yeah, this is Jeremy up to one of his tricks again. You know, what's, what, there's a punchline here. What's he saying? And I went on and I said, and why wouldn't I? I mean, let's look at the robots. They're never late. They're never, they don't go on holiday. They're not coming in with a hangover. They're not only thinking about this evening. They're not surreptitiously trying to look at their phone all the way to the service. And, 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 and the customer interaction, I mean, somebody comes through the door, they say, good evening. How are you? Do you have a reservation? And the person coming through the door will say, yes, my name is King. And they're not wildly looking through the lists of names, et cetera, because they haven't bothered to read the manifest properly. Immediately the robot says, yes, Mr. King table for two at eight o'clock. And they're not wildly looking around to see if the table's ready. They know that the table's ready and, uh, so your table's ready or is not, would you have to go to the bar? And they don't forget to give the information shit about this person. And don't forget, I mean, we haven't even talked about iridology and the fact that they could recognize this person quite soon, you know, much better. And so it goes on. Yes, it's expensive. And but the, the, the return of investment is going to be, is going to be pretty good. So why wouldn't I? And they're still looking at me at the staff and they say, is he serious? Is he really, he's not really serious, is he? And. I said, well, I'll tell you why I'm not actually going to do that. So because those robots have no empathy, they have no sympathy, they have no intuition, they have no instinct and they can't love. And these are all things you can do, but you're not. So if you don't start humanizing yourself and looking at the, the person coming through the door like you would yourself, then you're going to lose out to AI. But we have an immense advantage over everybody, and particularly in, hospita in hospitality. Mm. That's when we want to be looked after. We're not looking for pure efficiency. And, and there, there is a lot of, um, with the new restaurants, my team is saying, uh, assume you're going to want to enter orders into the EPOS system to the side. And I said, no, we can go with handheld. You go, really, really? You're actually prepared? I said, yes, because the, A, there's been a break. That is the new technology. We have to embrace it. And just because we used to do, do it that way, it doesn't mean to say it's the only way to go forward. We're, we're developing all the time. And I've used to, I mean, it, 
it was amazing. I, I forced through having an EPOS system on a point of sale system on, on the staff when we opened the Ivy back in 1990. And that was really new up to then. It was all handwritten bills, hand mm. ad addition, et cetera. It didn't have cashiers, lots of mistakes, slow. Or, or... But in those days, to put in an order, for instance, a coffee, you would probably put in, you'd have to tap in the numbers 1001 or maybe 10001. And so it would go on and modifications would have numbers. And some of the staff were brilliant because there may be three or 400 different, what they call PLUs to enter. And one day I heard on the news that there was this amazing technological advancement. So early nineties, they're saying soon there will be computers where you'll be able to touch the screen and things will happen. And of course, you know, 30 years later, it's, it, it's, it's incredible to think otherwise. So I contacted the maker Romanko and I said, right, we'll help you develop this. I want touch screens. And we got into the situation. I announced it, uh, that we were going to move to touch screens, which made it so much easier. And a lot of the staff said, no, we want to stay with the, stay with the old system because the fear of change. Yeah. I remember putting up a big sign because I keep hearing, why can't we just leave it, you know, leave it as it is, as normal. And, uh, I put a big sign upside outside my office that said, change is normal and, uh, left it like that because that's, what's holding us back. I mean, you know, let's face it. Hospitality has had an, an awful lot of curveballs thrown at it mm. in terms, you know, Brexit, uh, being 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 uh an extraordinary punch in the solar plexus i was listening to an old friend of mine last night was uh architect friend was getting a medal from spanish king and i was listening to the presentation and he was talking about the period he'd been in galicia when during covid and then he said you know it was a difficult time because you know, suffering from a condition known as long Brexit as opposed to long <laughs> COVID because, you know, that, that it, we have an immense amount of, of curveballs, but we shoot ourselves in the foot quite often because we're not open to changing. And I think there's any number of ways that hospitality can be better. Do you think that, you know, some, you know, some of the surprises that's come over the last couple of years, not only, you know, Brexit, pandemic, you know, inflation, whatever you can come with one black swan after the other. Do you think that's also because we haven't adapted before we are forced to it in the industry in general? We, we do it when we fall, we, we are faced with the cha challenge in principle. Yeah. yeah sometimes we, we're forced and some of, some of the forcing was good. I, I, I liked uh, the fact that the pandemic made us reassess everything we did. And it was, I think staffs, I mean, I worked really, really hard to protect our staff and my team, it was a, an exec team of five so that we, we didn't have to, uh, lay people off that we supported that we did any number of initiatives. The only people we couldn't keep were those who were purely in a trial period anyway, weren't even full and we raised money and it appeals to the customers, etc. But the staff really is the first time the breaking down the normal was an option. And I think we did some really good things with revised working ways, not cutting back or anything like that, but actually giving people a greater gratification from the job, but by taking out layers of management, which weren't necessarily productive. What I did feel, and I was wrong, I wrote, I wrote in, in one of my newsletters at the time, as we came out of the pandemic, as one of the things, benefits I felt was that, because it was that euphoria, if you remember, when restaurants opened, everybody was, uh, would, was so thrilled to be back in restaurants. And they were so grateful for the staff, the, the, the treatment of staff was that much better and tips were greater and, and those, and people realized how hard the hospitality industry had, had 
how hard a time they'd had. And I thought, this is wonderful because I think customers will have a greater appreciation of restaurant staff, and restaurateurs, et cetera, which is, which is terrific. And by, on the converse, I think also restaurant staff and restaurateurs will have a greater appre appreciation of customers and that who knows whether we are going to be going into a golden halcyon period of uh, understanding about the hospitality business. Sadly, that wasn't the case and people reverted uh, mm. back to, to type only too quickly. But I do, I do still, uh, I know that you're an optimist about the business and I, I'm an optimist, but only, only if we actually look at it from a point of view. I mean, a great thing of becoming older is my children would come through the restaurants and work. And when that happens, you look at your business in a very different way because they are they're having those staff conditions or staff food or whatever, rotary, et cetera. And so I would explain to staff, well, having learned from my children's experience of coming through the restaurants, I work on a very simple basis that, that you are all children of other people. And just as I would like my children to be looked after, I, I want to look up after you and I think when it comes to my return into the restaurant business, even though when I was, I'd be talking with the design team and the facilitators, et cetera, I said, no, we've got to have more staff space. We've got to have this. We've got to give the, a good staff experience. And, and they would say, well, Jeremy, you've always historically have been thought of to, to be the best of employers. I said, it doesn't mean to say we're good enough. We can still be better. We can still improve. We can still make it. And I think my holy grail when it comes to staffing is that I would talk to them. I said, when you're out together, maybe out of hours, you know, having a drink or a coffee or a meal, and you're talking about the restaurants, try not to spend too much time talking about the restaurants. There's a lot else in life. But when you do and you hear yourself or somebody else saying, what they should do is this or what they should do is that a tell us but b ask yourself what what is it we can do so that you don't say they but we what mm. we should be doing is this what we should be doing is that and that's for me is the holy grail and, and i want to infuse my staff with in with a positivity I want them to feel empowered. I want them to feel not, nothing but uh, nothing but proud of being part of the organization and being actually in hospitality. And of course, being in Britain, it has been so much a thing about servitude and, uh, uh, and that's, there's no reason for that because, you know, I think, I think you've looked up on, uh, on things I've said, but it, it might be worth saying again is that. I will talk to people in the industry and say, if restaurateuring is about finding a space, decorating it, putting in a kitchen, finding staff, getting customers to come through the door, down, giving them a menu, taking, cooking some food, serving some food, clearing the plates, giving some more service, giving them a bill, bye, see you soon. If that's what it's about, it is the worst occupation you could hope to have. It's the most boring job and why would anybody do it? But if you look at restaurateuring and its role in culture, in society over the years, the fact that for me, I don't think there's a single artistic, architectural, musical, political, revolutionary movement that hasn't started in a grand cafe or a restaurant or a brasserie as the heart of the culture. And if you start to understand who the people are who are coming through the door, what they do, why they know each other, why they're saying hello to different people, what's, what the occasions are, what they're doing with their life, and, that, and then start to, to think carefully about the history, the architectural history. I, I mean, one of the things which made me sad when I left school is that I thought I might be an architect, but I don't think I would have been quite good enough. 
or a performer or a, or a painter or a writer or something. But actually, well, so I was disappointed not to do that. I realized as I got older that actually restaurateuring offers all those things. And I, I do architecture, I do history, art, writing, you know, all, all those things. And if you, if you then as in the restaurant business, start to learn about how food is produced or grown, mm -hmm. the alchemy of food when it goes into the kitchen. I, I remember being very young and not understanding, but starting to appreciate that if you brown meat in a pan before you put it in the oven, it's a completely different thing. And that's just one of the very, very basic of the complexity in, of cooking. And then wine. I mean, I, I know a lot about wine, but if I stop stopped doing everything and for two years just learned about wine i'd still not be fully conversant with every aspect of it and so it goes on then it becomes as exciting as interesting and stimulating a profession as that you could ever hope to have but we have yeah. to teach that yeah and it's not it's awesome. not about chefs shouting at you it's not about working 70 hour weeks it's not about heat and noise and abusive customers and all those things all things which exist in our industry, but hopefully we're going to excise soon. Yeah, it's very interesting you said that. I had a, a similar conversation with, with Chip Conley from, from the US uh, at episode number 100, where he talks about hospitality gives you that opportunity to really stand humanity and history through food, you know, yeah. and, and, and how to be a real human. Because that was the, the, the subject we talked about. And I think you're absolutely right. We just forget that. It becomes all about the semantics, maybe sometimes. We forget to give mm. people those add-on values actually as we do it uh, as a profession. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. You you talked about it's been a journey. There's been lots of obstacles from the early days and so on. What has been like in the last couple of years when people look from the outside, that sounds like a very difficult journey. What have your learnings been? even though you, you know, you've been quite some decades in, in the industry, but what has been some significant learnings in, in your professional life you, you take with you? I, I mean, my personal learnings is that I do realize I, I enjoy working with people. I don't enjoy working for people and I have very spent very little time in my life working for people. But there is this, um, I think it's Steve Jobs who, who said the tragedy of often in business. And he was talking about Apple at the time, hmm. said how we often, the big business will see innovation or excellence or real quality in a small, much smaller company or an individual. And we think, Ooh, we must have some of that. We'll invest in it or we'll buy it, et cetera, because they they're doing things better or differently or innovatively. And he says, as soon as we've got control of them, we then start telling them how to do it. And that is unfortunately what most people are, are beset with. And I know that I can only work successfully if I can be in control. And I, I think it is a, but being in control, being a leader is, is not about looking after the business, looking after yourself, it's looking after the people you're leading and, and it's an enhanced responsibility to lead people. Otherwise, what's that lovely quote? They, they, uh, they said of somebody in the army, his men would follow him wherever he went, but purely out of curiosity. And, uh, the, it's, uh, that, that danger. And I. I feel so st strongly that, that through adversity, I've learned clarity. I, I would give the example of at one point when the company was getting large and I called nine significant managers together and we needed to make a decision. I think it was a technology decision. I can't even remember what it was, but I do know that every single one of them disagreed with what the innovation that I was about to make. And I said, well, thank you. As, and I've gleaned some interesting stuff and it's, it's in, impacted on my decision, but my actual decision is to go ahead and incorporate this and, and one, and I like this, I like 
people to uh, to question. I don't like them to be, I suppose, what you'd call insubordinate. But I like people to to challenge me, I, I, which is a very which is a very different thing. And one of them said, "In that we all think you're wrong. Why is it we are going ahead?" Uh, you know, I said, well, firstly, this is not a democracy, and democracy is, can be very dangerous. This is a benign dictatorship, but uh, it's a benign dictatorship where I care about you, I love you all, and you know, I respect you all, but somebody has to lead because in the past, if I look back in my history to early days of Capri's, 1983-4, I suggested that we buy a computer and that was very early days of computer in fact the computer i bought was called an apricot you know it's funny it was apples apricots blackberries the the whole thing and everybody thought i was mad and subsequent groups like you or individuals have told me that i'd be foolish to get epos systems email voicemail reservation systems, any number of things, somebody's told we didn't need it. And the committee decision, going back to that old reactionary that said, would have meant we'd always been three, four, five years behind. And I like to be a leader. I like, I like to find a way to do things. And one, and I, I suppose one of the things I learned was actually through somebody's generosity, I, I was bemoaning the fact that there weren't any mentors around. My mentor, Max, who I, meant, um, who I talked about earlier, had gone to and disappeared in Toronto. Although he wasn't a role model, Peter Langan taught me an awful lot about respiratory generally because he had an innate genius for it. And I was complaining, where are the people to look around to, for, to look up to? And they said, Jeremy, you know, perhaps you should stop for a moment and, and not look up, but look down. And you, you may find that there are a lot of people who are actually looking to you for leadership. So stop messing around with looking for leaders. Do some leading yourself. And it was a very generous thing for somebody to say, right? oh, Okay, I've got a different responsibility. So I like to find time for people. I like to listen. I like to learn from my mistakes. I like, I realize things, you know, it, you know, it hasn't always been very successful. I've realized that everything I regret in my life has been something that I did because I felt I should rather than what that I wanted. That's it's, it's, a, it's the biggest curse when you, you get a, committee of people persuading you to do something and yet against your better judgment. I learned, I, I, one of my favorite sayings is that a camel is a horse designed by a committee and it's, and it really is. And the camel is actually will do the job that you want to, when you set out looking for a horse Yeah, and it'll get you to the place and it'll be cheaper, but it will be a lot slower and it'll be a lot smellier and a lot more uncomfortable. When you want a horse, you want a horse, but committees allow allow us to make these decisions and i think the the blight of politics business life in 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 general so i i avoid anybody who i love advice i love listening i love interaction but i i can't bear it when somebody thinks they can tell me what to do uh, that's a really interesting learning because i think many founders or business owners or that has advisors, boards, investors coming along over time. And I think I've heard it multiple times where they actually knew what the right thing was and they were talked into another thing. It can be the way they go to market, it can be the way they design their guest experience. So it could be many, many, many things. And I think actually, you know, it's about, you know, you know, if you have that gut feeling and you can in a way justify it, it could be in numbers, it could be, then you have to hold on to it because you have that, in, you know, as the founder of a business, you just have that connection with the soul of the business as you talk about as well. You know what the right thing is to do. You see it before others because you're so into it day out and day in every second mm -hmm. of your life. 
Well, I, I'm so glad you mentioned it. And, you, and you, as you said, you got feeling. And I, for years and years and years, uh, because I had, if, some, if you were to ask me what was my weakness through a lot of my life, it was people pleasing. Mm. Now, people pleasing is not a bad trait for a restaurateur at heart, mm. but there's the there's different forms of people pleasing. And people pleasing comes when you're trying to make everybody around you happy thinking that will make you happy, whereas actually you must make yourself happy yourself. And we are scared of our instinct, of our intuition, as you say, gut feeling. And some really interesting books have been written. I think it was David Brooks who wrote The Social Animal, which is, is very much about, about instinct. And I've heard him lecture and talk about famously soldiers in Iraq or Afghanistan who could who'd be asked to look at a street and say, is there an improvised explosive device in the street? The street? And one in particular would say yes or no, with like 98% accuracy. And they'd say, well, how do you do this? He said, I don't know. I said, well, why do you say yes or no? He said, well, if I think, if I get a cold feeling in my chest, I say yes, because this is the whole thing of butterflies in our stomach and, and so on. But in this, in society now, we're not allowed to to be very judgmental and say, I, I believe, and it, you know, I've had interactions where I demanded that a member of staff who I'd caught stealing something very innocuous is, is dismissed and imagine, I said, you're being really harsh. And I said, it's, you know, you're not normally this harsh. I said, yeah, there was something about him it was the way he stole. He's a thief. He's an absolute thief. And the, and, and the staff go, oh, you, how can you say that? How can you say that? And then three weeks later, the police came looking for him with this whole long list of things he'd done, including credit card fraud and so on and so forth. But it's very difficult to reconcile in society nowadays is, is intuition and gut, and gut feeling. But I think we have to go for it. And, 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 and the practical side, just the same way as that I'm sure there's a lot of people have had the same experience me is that we, you're going to look at a new apartment or a new house or something and you walk through the door and you know it's the place for you from the hallway you haven't even gone in you haven't looked around or anything you're in the hallway and you go this is it this is going to be great and then it turns out to be great occasionally not but and any number of things you meet somebody at a party and you think this person is trouble and it's just it, my my dogs just run through the door. I love the instinct she has. She's out. She, the, you know, she'll. She's the friendliest, friendliest dog, with other dogs and with people, and then occasionally not. And normally, it's well, it's well founded. And she's also the person who, you know, fifteen minutes before I arrive home, is at the window waiting for me, and I don't come home at a regular time every day. They, you know. And hospitality is so much about instinct and so much about the ability to look at somebody and know what they want, what they need, or whether it's going well, or they're insecure, or they're angry, or whatever it is, immediately yeah, just to feel that. And it comes back to the empathy and why we won't be replaced by robots as long as we strive to give people wonderful experiences. Yes, yeah, so, so what you're saying there is also what I call the uh, the sixth sense, you know, mm -hmm. and in and, and teams I've been part of, uh, I often have that role of the sixth sense, uh, especially around the recruitment of people. I had this yeah. thing and they said, Michael, what do you think? I think we need to test for this or we need to look after this. You know, I, my God says that this is not right. And the reason why is that and I've become better at refining it over the years, knowing straight away what it is and actually become very factual about it because I knew I had to convince other leadership team mm. about my sixth sense. It could also be about a supplier. It could be, it'd be good or bad. You know, this is the right person. This is how yeah. it's going to play out. And I think sometimes, you know, we forget that, especially in this society that's very driven on data. Data is very, very good because you can make some sound decision, but sometimes you need to look at the invisible stuff and where the only the sixth sense works so right. I, I love i love that you you brought it up in that way a couple more questions jeremy before mm -hmm. before it's off um you talked a lot about books as we've gone through this conversation mm -hmm. 
you can see behind me, there's a small collection of books as well. I'm an avid reader and really want to learn from the best of the best. And I believe like you, you cannot stand still. You have to challenge what you did well today, tomorrow. But what I'd like is your top book to give away to, to other people. Well, of course, I've talked about you know, Getapado, the leopard, which I have often given, but I, it's <laughs> empirical, this, because twice in the last two weeks, I've given the same, the same book to two Ooh. separate people, one on the occasion of their 40th birthday, one on the occasion of their 60th birthday, and there's somebody else who I'm going to give it to. And it's a book which I read, first of all, when I was about 19, and I thought, oh, this is silly. This is, life isn't like that. It's a bad example. And the book's called A Dance to the Music of Time, and is written by a man called Anthony well, it's spelled Powell, but with a certain affectation, he's known as Anthony Pohl. And he was one of those Brits who, who, who would speak a, a little bit funnily. And it charts the history of his protagonist from days at Eton um, through to older age and the, and the life basically lived in London, but in country houses, etc. And you could read it um, as being a bunch of, a sort of bunch of toffs behaving badly. But, and I was a little bit that way at the age of 19. Mm. And then when I read it again, when I was about in the early thirties, suddenly I realized it was very, very insightful about life and that it really reflected life in, in in its complex in its complexity and relationships and so on and that as i got older anybody who, who may have read the book will know that there's a character called widmerpool who's fairly despicable but does well in life and we all have our widmerpools in life and there's a lot of allegory and metaphor and it, it's so i it i love it as a book the trouble with giving this book is actually 12 books. It's, so oh, it's quite, it's quite a, a weighty volume. It came out sequentially over, uh, I think about 35 years as 12, uh, individual, individual novels. Um, but that's my, that's my book. I've got lots of other books and which I admire. And, you know, I think it, when it comes to hospitality, Danny Meyer's book, setting the table, uh, mm. still stands up as, uh, in many ways exemplary i there's some more recent people who getting a lot of attention i'm not i'm not so keen on um you know and, and i'm always i uh, looking to uh to learn from other uh, other sides of life you know there is a book i was always very keen on is the uh, about extraordinary extraordinary knowing I don't remember what the exact title is. I think looking up on my my list or Malcolm. You know, I also love Malcolm Gladwell. I think there's a lot mm. to learn from him, and the, the books or many of the books and the notion of blink, uh, where to yeah. practice something a long time. Uh, any number of them. But my favorite book, my Desert Island book, I would cheat and say Dance the Music Time because I'd get twelve volumes. Yeah, and I love I love that, and uh, I'll definitely look into that. What do you think you gain from reading these books through your life? And I'll, I can hear you reread books as well, because mm. I think it's a it's a very rare thing. People read books and then say I've read it, but in principle, it's it's a very good book. In my in my example, The Alchemist. Uh, I've read right. that book probably twenty times since. It really, I was yeah. 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 And and every time I learn something significant new, or I'm just in a different place, so I haven't. You know, you never step down in the same stream of water again. You just, yeah. you're in a different place. You're not the same person. Yeah. And there's, uh, and there's some, you know, some interesting writers who do bear returning to the, the likes of Robert, Robert Hughes, who was Fatal Shore or it's shock, you know, shocking you, all, all, all those people. And of course the, the great classics, although I found that a lot of the classics, I was better off listening to them than reading them because I do think that there's a particular sort of rhythm about books and the way that they come. And it often, 
also somebody reading it actually makes them much more accessible. Uh, a book like Tender as the Night, Scott Fitzgerald teaches me a lot about a period of time, but also about interaction and, and, and humanity, particularly in, the, in a, in a post-war Europe is, is fast. First World War Europe is, is fascinating. Yeah, we, we could talk for a long time, couldn't we? Yeah, we could talk about books for a very, very long time. But that's really interesting. What is your, your top advice to, to leaders out there in the industry that is uh, trying to find a way in the new era of hospitality, Jeremy? My top advice is that your staff are just as important as your customers. And you have to listen to both, but have, have the uh, confidence of your own, of your own judgment, uh, it takes, it takes a, a, a special person to change their mind because of what they hear. It takes a fool to be forced to change their mind. We need, we need to have confidence in our own ability and goes back to what we were talking about earlier is that, uh, as a leader, I think if your intuition and instinct have to be listened to. Yeah, and I love that because, uh, yeah, I think if we, we want to win in the future, we need to be good at home, as I call it, take care of the people around us, and then they will take care of the guests and the guests will take care of the revenue and the rest will follow. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show, Jeremy, and sharing your incredible journey and especially the learnings you've had over the years around, you know, facing the obstacles around humility but also what we can learn from, you know, uh, reading books and how we can translate that into to, to life and, and leadership. Where can people learn more about where you, what you're up to now, maybe even connect with you and, and see what's going on right now with Jeremy King and, and, and the future um, yeah. in your world? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit elusive. I'm just thinking how, how best to do that. And, I had to because I, my enforced sabbatical, I, I embraced uh, Instagram, but I'm afraid I'm private on Instagram at the moment, but I will, I will be coming um, more public. As it happens, and anybody listening will think that this, uh, this was prearranged, I am actually writing a book at the moment, mm. and which I have to deliver next month, which... Mm. And I, uh, so I imagine coming out uh, during the course of the year, I'm trying to think for anybody who has listened to this and ha wants to contact me, there will be, uh, there is emails such as info at jeremykingrestaurants.com is probably the best way. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear and very happy to respond. Great, great. We will put that in, in, in the show notes for, for people and also look out for when you book out and, and share that with the uh, the audience through our weekly newsletter when, when that comes. Okay. Jeremy, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, power and energy to the journey ahead. And, and thank you for, for coming back to the industry. No, well, well, thank you. I appreciate that very much.